Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. You're listening to a new Securing Bridges podcast. You're about to join Alyssa Miller as she sits down with senior and executive security leaders to share stories of success and failure while working across business teams. It's time to build and secure the bridge to the business. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Hey, everybody, we're back. Yeah, I know, I took a week off, you know, travel and all those things, do what they do, but here we are once again on Securing Bridges. I'm so excited to be back with you all. Thank you for tuning in. It is great to be back once again. If you have not checked out the previous episodes, you've got to do that. We have had some absolutely astounding guests on the show. The conversations have been amazing. And it, as usual, this week is no different. I am so looking forward to this one. So without further ado, let, let, let's introduce our guest for this week. Um, from all the way across the pond, and I'm talking about that really big Atlantic pond, okay, uh, we've got Andra Zaharia. Andra, how are you? Hi, Alyssa. Very excited to be here. Extremely excited to talk to you uh, because I've been a true fan for a long time, but I like never really worked up the courage to, uh, you know, introduce myself and, and, and say hi and things like that. So I'm, I'm just psyched to be here and to be able to contribute. <laughs> that, that, well, I'm not even going to touch on how mind numbing that is that you're, you, you had any reservations about connecting with me. Well, let's move beyond that. We'll just ignore that for a second. But, uh, no, seriously, let, let's jump in. I know it's late, so clearly you're excited. I mean, you, you stayed up late uh, to, to be here with us. So um, let's find out a little bit about you. Uh, for those of the folks out there that don't know you or you know maybe haven't heard of your, your podcast or other things, just um, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do. Of course. So I have a background in PR and communication. And uh, right after college, we started working with tech startups, which at the time were still kind of nascent and pretty exotic. <laughs> and I was one of the, uh, I think one of the, the like three women, uh, three young women in the entire industry. Uh, I'm not even exaggerating. So that was a kind of an education for me. And around seven years ago, I uh, started working in cybersecurity because that entire startup environment led me to work for a cybersecurity startup. And that's kind of when I found my calling as, <laughs> as cliche as that sounds, it really everything clicked for me. And I have become a different, better person because uh, of working in, well, due to working in, in this industry and meeting all of the great people who aren't, who are, you know, who draw from multiple disciplines, who, who put so much of themselves into this work. And um, I basically found a way to give my work meaning. And what I do now is that I work with uh, customers on taking care of their content programs, on, on getting their teams to contribute with their expertise, uh, helping technical people hone their writing skills, and helping them gain clarity around you know what customers really want and helping them avoid stereotypes and cliches and all of the thing that technical leaders hate about marketing and sales. And there's no shortage of that. The list is long and full of horrors, and rightfully so. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, 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 you know, that's kind of my my mission. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, but I found a new angle to that a few years ago. I realized that. The angle is empathy. The angle is connection. Uh, it's not just about fighting against something, but for something. And I think that that kind of draws a parallel between what the entire industry is actually for, because we're doing so many things against things, but the deepest, most powerful and positive motivation comes from doing something that we care about, uh, which is, you know, keeping people safe and making the world a better place. <laughs> I'm I'm sitting here dumbfounded right now that that's the first time I've heard that term and I'm 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 loving it. I don't know, maybe I live under a rock, but I, I the, the whole concept, yes, of 
fight for something rather than just fighting against. I think cybersecurity in particular, we kind of, we we always fall into that, right? Like we're always fighting against something. We're always fighting against attackers. We're always fighting against, you know, people in our organization who we're, we're failing to connect with. And so that's, I, that's an interesting thing is that, is that kind of, where did, where did that come from for you? I mean, how did you get to that point? Well, honestly, the biggest kind of strides and progress that I've made in my career as a contributor to cybersecurity and in my life in general have come through actually going to therapy and coaching and working on myself. Uh, and that's what I actually found. You know, I, I started to understand many of the problems that lead people to not be able to communicate well, not be able to internalize all of the things that they, you know, um, evangelize and they try to get other people to do uh, many types of, you know, mental biases, uh, many problems that kind of distort decision making and clear thinking and all of these things, studying them and kind of picking apart a few topics that came kind of surface for me as the most important one of them being decision making, the other being empathy um, has led me to uh, find these kind of parallels because I think that, and this is something that more experienced marketers and communicators uh, have in common, is that they focus on things that don't change. Things that don't change about human nature, uh, about our interaction with our environment, because those persisting problems, and cybersecurity knows a lot about this, <laughs> um, these persisting problems are the ones that once you solve or get closer to solving, unlock a lot of other good stuff. Uh, and they make things easier for so many more people and they become scalable. So that is actually the source that I've drawn on for the past decade the most. And again, it's, it's working in this industry that gave me an opportunity to align what I believe in with what I do and find some meaning in that work, which is not easy as a marketer, especially when the entire industry hates you. Because <laughs> it's true. And again, not unwarranted. This is a reality. Uh, we, we speak about it on Twitter, uh, you know, almost <laughs> at least weekly uh, in bigger debates. Um, so it's just something that we have to look into. But when we feel that resistance, it serves all of us to look into why that's happening, what we can do to improve on that. You know, it's one of those situations because, yeah, I, I see it and I'll admit, I, you know, I engage in some of the discourse around that too because it is frustrating. But what bothers me in that scenario, and it bothers me not just it, when we're talking about recruiters, marketing people, salespeople, whatever, is there's a lot of absolutism that people use when they have those conversations, right? And it's like, let, let's not ignore that there are a lot of really good, smart people in marketing who are not just throwing out awful hyperbole and all of these like wild claims about what tools and products can do or whatever. Like, there are a lot of people doing really cool, creative stuff in these marketing communities. And I, I think it's, you know, it is unfortunate that sometimes in security, we, we kind of for, lose sight of that. And I mean, it happens all over society, right? I mean, with everything, Absolutely. a large group gets characterized by the actions of, you know, a subset of that group. Um, and I, I feel like people kind of forget that, you know, without the marketing side of this, we probably wouldn't have a lot of the really cool tools and things that we like to play with on a daily basis. <laughs> um, you know, when you find out even some of the cool open source tools that you're using are, you know, they're, they're paying marketing people to do stuff. This logo you see behind me, like I, I actually paid, you know, somebody to create my logo for me. And that, that again, I, you know, she would call herself probably more of a graphics designer, but that's, you know, a component of marketing. So that's, how does that, you know, you said you're working with other your customers are people you're working with to help them understand it. Do you get that same kind of struggle with them when you go to them and you're trying to you know, teach them or you know, help educate them on how to be better in that space? Do you ever get that pushback as well from them that like, oh, you're just marketing or whatever? Fortunately not, but I have had conversations. So generally, I think that one of the 
issues is, I guess, that um, the role of a marketer or a communicator, because that it takes on many roles these days, it's very multifaceted. But the role of a communication specialist is not just to create a message that sells and, you know, distribute it across channels and so on and so forth. It's to understand who you're talking to, why you're talking to them, why this company and this team creates a product under service that they're building and maintaining and trying to, you know, grow. What's their deeper motivation and where does uh, kind of where do their motivation and the customer's needs align? What's that connection point? What What's the bridge that unites them? And there's so much more value. I mean, marketing as a profession has evolved tremendously over the past decade. Uh, it has a lot of neuroscience. It has tons of insights about behavioral patterns patterns and all sorts of things that are incredibly helpful. And obviously, just like anything and a lot of things in cybersecurity as well, you can use it as a weapon, you can use it to manipulate people, or you can use it to serve people, you can use it to bring clarity, you can use it to align customers uh, and company owners and their teams. You can use it to explain to technical people why the problems they think they're solving are actually not the problems that the customer is coming to them to solve. Uh, and you can just bring a lot of clarity, focus, and this alignment that's very productive and that removes a lot of tension. So I'm very lucky to be able to work with customers who know the value of of you know content of, of communication of building community and of building non-standard stuff of asking interesting questions of putting their specialists uh in the limelight but not just in a way that makes them look good but in a way that they tackle some very interesting important things from other perspectives and um, I had won't deny that I have had challenges with technical people who had thought that, you know, oh, this work is <laughs> so superficial and it's not something that they do because I saw how, you know, the CDO or other technical leaders were pushed by sales to deliver products that they hadn't built because sales had promised them. And I hate that this happens. I hate that there are still... Uh, you know, people in cybersecurity companies who don't use a password manager, who don't, you know, preach, who don't practice the things that they preach. I don't think that 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 difference, that gap between claim and behavior is so visible to everyone. And it's one of the reasons uh, why there are still so many challenges to be to be fixed. But I do think that people are becoming a lot more, let's say, open and perceptive to things that are real, things that are authentic, things that talk to people like human. There is no B2B marketing, B2C marketing. There is just communication with people. We're not selling to companies. And I love that I, I, you know, I worked my way up to a position where I can choose to work with customers who believe the same things. <laughs> and that gives me tons of energy, tons of enthusiasm. Um, and a deep sense of gratitude and reward to be working with people in this industry who really believe in what they do and they're doing it for the right reasons, not just to make, you know, uh, tons of money and uh, build unicorns. <laughs> I mean, making tons of money is nice too, but you know. It absolutely is. It absolutely <laughs> is. <laughs> I mean, let's be fair. I think probably most, if not all of us in cybersecurity, would probably stop doing this tomorrow if we didn't have bills to pay and all that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, so you mentioned like working with technical people, right? And that even that term, I'm always I'm a little careful about using that. But people, you know, who do have that technical focus, who you mentioned, you're know, trying to help them understand solving the right problem. And um, so when it comes to cybersecurity in particular, where is there like a theme there? Something that like you spend a lot of time working with them to to try to get them to do differently, to see differently. Uh, I mean, what is what does it look like when you're dealing with that particular audience and trying to change how they look at things? 
Mm. My first goal is to get them to talk directly to customers. So for example, for one of my main customers uh, that I've been working with for almost three years, because I, I like to work with people in the long run, that's when you get to the you know deeper stuff. I introduced a customer development process with them, which is basically having interviews with customers, but where you're not trying to sell them anything. You're not necessarily trying to get product feedback. You're there to talk about them and what they need and what their troubles are and what their context is and just listen your role is just to listen because uh the thing is that in cybersecurity and in many other industries in the world in general there's a huge imbalance between speaking and listening and you only become a better communicator a better business builder a better anything when you listen more than you talk but as it turns out <laughs> and how, what i learned through the past three months of doing uh, an entire program dedicated to enhancing listening skills is that we're not as good at it as we think we are. So my goal is to introduce this process and to give them like a set of questions. I do interviews with them in the beginning to show them how to ask these questions without them feeling forced, without feeling like the other person uh, is, you know, just being taken through a checklist <laughs> and being just you know squeeze for information and while also giving them something valuable in return and, and making that perhaps the beginning of a relationship that can evolve into like a human relationship between here's what i need here's how we could do you know maybe this would help make the product better for my use case and things like that and that has worked wonders so after the first two interviews that we did, the CEO told me like, we need to do this every day and the entire team needs to be involved. And they have been doing that ever since uh, we started. And they've done over, I think almost a hundred of these conversations and they're documented and all of the insights get shared with the entire team. So everyone can learn from it, whether it's product, whether it's, uh, you know, business leaders, where whoever it is. And that brings, again, such alignment because everyone can clearly see what the actual situation is, how people are using the product in real life, not just from analytics, where they understand the customer's context. You know, maybe they're at a point in their career where they want to change careers or they want to advance in their role. And part of their work depends on that product. So if that doesn't work and doesn't align with their needs, they're holding them back from advancing. So it's all, it all becomes very personal and it, it, you get to have skin in the game. You as a, you know, person in a technical role, whatever it is that you're doing, you get to understand that your work matters and impacts someone in a very real way. And there is honestly no amount of data or storytelling or whatever that can create that connection. And I can see people get excited when they get good feedback. I can see them working harder when they know that something is a big issue for customers and it just keeps going. Everyone wants to be involved uh, and it just transforms the way that people you know, uh, see themselves as contributors to both their companies, uh, to their own careers, but also to the bigger community, which is pretty awesome to see. <laughs> that is incredible. So now a lot of what you described sounds more like, okay, we're producing a product, we're selling it, get the engineers talking to the, essentially the consumer, you know, you know or obviously those might be businesses, but that that end customer is going to purchase something. Has anybody ever asked you to do this same exercise internally with like internal customers where engineers are maybe meeting and having these types of conversations with maybe users of internal apps that they develop or, uh, you know, teams that they support? Because what I'm thinking is like, I'm, I'm thinking about a security people, right? And I'm trying to, if, if I'm trying to align my security program with my business objectives, which is how we build one of those bridges, boy, what, you know, one of the key elements of that seems like it is that same thing. Let's understand how are they using what we give them mm -hmm. today? What do they actually feel like they need from us? And, and can we connect there? So have you ever, have you run into that or is it more kind of on that mar sales marketing side? 
Uh, not necessarily. It can definitely. So this process can be adapted to this kind of context as well. But my particular case is that I usually work with companies whose founders are security people. So okay. the that kind of changes the entire thing because even though they're building a business and they're you know they know what the business priorities are to them the technical accuracy and technical validity of what they're building is more important than you know any sort of growth because they know that you can have one without the other they know that the cybersecurity community will call you bluff if you're trying to exaggerate a score squeeze in uh, uh we do everything for everyone and we're the best at anything and just as you mentioned you know if you're trying to, to 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 speak to people in absolute terms or make claims that you cannot possibly uh you know support so i i do pick my customers in that way um because for example what i do and the way that i like to work doesn't necessarily work for huge companies um, in the sense that those environments are a bit more fragmented. I do like to work with companies when they're at a scale where everyone is as involved as possible because I know that I can contribute the most there with my experience, not just on the marketing side, but also as you know, a person going through their career, trying to figure out how to find a, a sustainable pace of working without burning yourself out, how to you know teach others and coach others uh, while still maintaining your your sanity and, and doing all of the things that make you human. So um, I choose to work with companies at this level and with bigger companies, I do work on specific projects where I try to, let's say, raise the bar as much as I can through content to try to show them what is the usual way of doing things and what I believe does not work about that. Because I also have, and I try to maintain the perspective of the consumer. I use a lot of cybersecurity products and I'm very, you know, I, the analysis is always in the background. It's always going on. I look at UX, I look at messaging, I look at everything. Um, I, I, I try my best to, you know, I always look at their messaging. I always look at the content that people put out and I've always very, very careful and I keep an eye on conversations happening, especially on Twitter, because that's where <laughs> that's where it's at. Um, and and show them like, hey, look at the people, you know, talking about all the cliches. Look at what gets people so mad that they have to go and post something about it. Uh, and I show them all of these examples so they know like we're not doing this. And if they want to do something like that, I will tell them that they're not, I'm not the person to work with because I simply will not, uh, you know, put lies forward or exaggerations or things like that. Um, I have been forced in the past to go, uh, let's say, to, to go on a path that wasn't mine, but uh, I quit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's all that. <laughs> no, and that, and that makes sense. I think, as we look at cybersecurity, I think a lot of us really kind of feel that certain sense of, I, I want to work for, you know, somebody who at least, you know, kind of supports my, my moral views of this or my ideological views of this, because for so many of us that got into cybersecurity was more because of ideological reasons than just, you know, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of cool tech and stuff we got to play with too, but it was hey, this was an opportunity to break this stuff down and to try to make technology safe. And so I, I think that's why, too, that we see so much venom when there is somebody who feels like they're just profiteering off of what we're trying to do. And we're like, wait a minute, we're actually trying to fix things here and you just all you want is money. So is that does that enter into some of the, the conversation then as well? um as far as like playing into those ideological views yes it, it definitely does first of all because they cannot be ignored second of all because uh, technology cannot be objective there are these principles of techno realism that someone in the uk drew up in the late 90s actually that sound very true today and they're basically big observations of the role of technology in society. They're very interesting. I turn, I go back to them really often. And one of them is that technology cannot be objective. Technology will always be swayed one way or another. And where 
obviously now at a point in human evolution where I believe that cybersecurity is not just essential to the stability of the world, quite literally, uh, both in the technological sense, but also in the geopolitical sense. And we can see that a lot today. Uh, and it, it, besides this, this huge impact, we cannot ignore these moral issues. It's first of all, because they affect us personally and the snowball effect of that is absolutely huge. And second of all, because you cannot be effective in building whatever it is, whatever solution you want to build, if you can get others to work with you. Uh, and here is where one of my principles comes in, which is you cannot do work that's for everyone. You will always address uh, a certain tribe, a certain group of people who understand what you do, who want what you do, because what you do is special and is different and is generous and it's specific. It's not generic, it's not for everyone. It is for a particular group of of people who appreciate what you do because you know how to solve that problem better than anyone because you care about it so so much so i believe that in any you know any type of business that you want to build any type of product that you want to build you cannot ignore the bigger conversation the bigger you know ecosystem that you're part of you cannot ignore your um let's say the the forces at play um and if you want to you know, challenge the status quo and do something better than others or than the norm, you're going to have, to, you're going to need to have some difficult conversations, both in terms of, you know, things like where do we stand in the market? What is our role? Who are we actually competing against? And how do we want to compete against them? Um, what are our values and not in the, we have some things written on the wall stuff. Um, so you just have to, go through that. There is no easy way through. It's it's like one of my favorite books says, the obstacle is the way. There are no uh, perfect answers to this. There is no perfect company. But there are companies who whose leaders strive more than other people. And uh, I really appreciate those people. I want to support those people. I want to champion them. And I want their voices to be heard because I know that they imp inspire others who are building their careers, who want to change their careers, who want to work with people like them because they believe in the same things. And when that happens, it's one of the most beautiful things ever. <laughs> so we have an interesting question that actually came in from one of our uh, viewers on LinkedIn. And so is, this is kind of an interesting question based off of what you were just talking about in particular, because what what are your thoughts? I mean, when you get in there and, and you're, you're trying to influence somebody and they're just not hearing it, right? There's, they're, they're missing the bigger picture. They're maybe they're a little more isolated in their thinking because of the, the culture of that organization. Do you, how do you recommend somebody works to overcome that? You first have to figure out what the other person truly needs. So there's this uh, quick framework that I'd like to reference, um, which is called the six human six human needs. You can you know you can uh, search for that online and read a bit about it. It's very interesting. And actually, one of the things that we learned in this um, listening workshop that I did for three months was to identify uh, someone's uh, needs based on the keywords that they use words that they use that might indicate that what sometimes so some people for example may lack clarity um that's one of our fundamental needs and, and many people may not have that even leaders who are expected to have that all the time but then not necessarily have that um other times for example it may be that they lack significance so they don't feel acknowledged perhaps by their bosses or managers they don't feel like their words are you know mean anything they're not seen their their work is not you know it's just not acknowledged and when you when you're able if you want to really you know connect to that person you always have to start with what they need and this is what i always this applies to everything that i do actually this is what i tell my clients never start so if you if you start a phrase about anything with i or we you're doing it wrong 
flip that. What the, what does that sound like if you start with you? Like, what do you need? Um, how do you, you know, see this? What are your priorities? And then align whatever it is that you're trying to say and connect it back to that. Here's how I can help you. First of all, you have to ask if they need help. Because uh, uh, as I have learned, <laughs> well, I always assume that people need help, but that's not helpful, <laughs> as paradoxical as it may sound. So I, I really believe in starting with what the person needs. And even the most let's say the most, uh, you know, reticent person, the, the person who does not want to hear about anything in anyone, they might feel overwhelmed. They may be having, you know, family troubles. Uh, people are battling always more than we can see. It's not always, we sometimes assume, let's say, bad intent, malicious intent, since we're uh, in this industry. But Often it's not that. Often it's another circumstance. And because we don't know that, we sometimes, you know, with for for good reasons, we, we try to get people to do other things. But if it doesn't align with what they want and what they need at that point in time, our message will just, you know, fly right by them. And this happens with people inside companies with companies who try to market products to people who don't have that need. I've seen that a lot with password managers, for example, because what people want, for example, in this specific instance, is not to, you know, improve their credentials. What they're tired about is changing their passwords because they can't remember them. Uh, and all that friction and all that frustration, which is very real and very powerful, that's a very emotional problem and it's something to solve. So this could be similar in an internal context as well. I know it's not a straightforward thing and it involves really being able to sit in silence and listen to what the other person has to say. Uh, it's about asking for clarifying questions. It's about um, trying to figure out if you really understood what the other person is saying and then working in your mind um, through all the things that you wanted to say and maybe delivering that at a slower pace from a different angle, from an angle that really connects and, and creates that aha moment. Because I do believe that most people are not, uh, don't have like bad intent, but they are overwhelmed and overworked and over, over it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow. So, I mean, you, you've talked a lot about the idea of empathy um, you know, and I, I don't think you've used the word more than once, but everything you're saying kind of speaks to that. It's an understanding that other side. So you also do a podcast around that. So can you tell the viewers a little bit more about that? Cause you know, they're already listening to one pretty cool podcast. Maybe they'd be up for adding <laughs> another to their list. I, I, I would love to, especially because this is something that had been brewing in my mind for a while, but I didn't have a name for it until it just clicked one day. So as we were talking in the beginning, when I realized, you know, I, I looked at my work and, and asked the question, how do I want to contribute? What is kind of the tiny legacy that I want to build? What's the angle that I'm coming from and how can I make things better with my work? And at first I was against something. I, I am and was and still am against cliches, against stereotypes, against absolute, you know, using absolute terms and, and a lot of other things that we see plenty of. Um, but then I realized that, you know, being against something is one thing, but it, that's not where the deeper motivation was. And this is something that I actually discovered the let's say inception moment was um, a quick exchange in, in Twitter DMs with Martin Gruden, uh, who is an absolutely wonderful human being, as I'm sure you know, and one of the kindest, nicest, most generous people in the industry. Um, and he kind of nudged me to think about like, yes, but what is the positive angle on this? And that's where empathy came into play. And well, coincidentally, last year, there was an article on Forbes, uh, that was called like empathy is one of the core traits of uh, that leaders must have. And it just, it became viral really quickly. 
but not just because it's trending and things, but because people understand, have a, a deeply unsatisfied need for a connection with their leaders, with their colleagues, with their families, with their partners, and so on and so forth, and most of all, with themselves. Uh, we are going through a connection crisis because the past few years have been insanely difficult for well, almost three years now, um, because we d that being able to connect with other people means being vulnerable, which is something that doesn't come naturally and it's difficult and it's painful and it takes a lot of effort. So most people don't do it. Um, so I wanted to create a, a place kind of with this podcast, a space where we could have conversations about what it is that gets people to connect. Because every time that I talk to people outside the industry and I do this like on a regular basis, because I got to keep my reality, you know, I got to be connected to reality. I always tell them that this industry is not about technology, it's about people. People build the technology, people drive improvement, people are bold enough and, and brave enough to do things that don't seem possible. And they always look at me like, what are you talking? <clears throat> Sorry, what are you talking about? This is, <laughs> what do you mean people? And I tell them about all of the fantastic, optimistic, driven, committed, generous people in this industry and that's when I, when I, you know, when I see them curious and when I see them having like, hey, I want to know more about this because this seems like something I can connect to versus all the technical stuff that I thought it was about, which is not for me because I'm not a technical person. I don't do that. It's too difficult. I don't want to touch it. But I am interested in people and what they have to say and the stories they have to tell. Um, and when I first launched the podcast, I actually got reactions from let's say both worlds, both ends of the bridge from people in the industry and outside the industry. Uh, I saw that it resonated with them. I saw that it got them excited uh, because these two terms, empathy and cybersecurity, seem to be contradictory, but they're not. <laughs> but people just, uh, we haven't just talked enough about what it is to apply it. So what I'm trying to do is, is talk about the real situations where you get to see empathy at work, how it feels, how we can replicate it, how we can apply it, how we can apply it to ourselves, uh, and how we can improve that connection and relationships. And um, hopefully, you know, keep the industry going in, in a healthier direction. <laughs> That's awesome. I, we There seems to be a certain... I w probably more than an undercurrent, I think, within the community now. I I've seen so many Twitter polls, like, what's the one skill you feel like we need more of in cybersecurity? And a lot of people, myself included, will respond with empathy because we, we do seem to kind of lose out on that. I know I preach it when I'm talking about how to deal even with, like, developers in a, a DevOps or DevSecOps model. Like, you have to have that empathy for what's going on in their world if you're gonna to ask to be a part of it. And that's something I, I think is important too, is just understand you are asking, you know, whether it's in sales, whether it's in security, whether it's something else, you're asking to be a part of their world. So you have to start to understand their world first. Um, so that's awesome. I think people should definitely uh, check that out. Do you wanna give the website real quick for your podcast? Sure. It's cyberempathy.org. Uh, and uh, I, I have a list of 100 questions coming up to help you practice empathy. I believe in the power of questions. Uh, it's going to be free to download, free to use, no wow. gatekeeping. Uh, and I'm very excited about it. It's been quite a challenge to put it together because 100 is a big number when you, when you start to go in depth so much. But I hope that it's going to be helpful to people and that they take these questions. And, and make them theirs. <laughs> cool. So we're getting down to the end of it, but I want to make sure, I want to wrap up with one last question. And taking everything that we've talked about here and what you, you know, your work that you do on a regular basis, which is amazing, by the way, I think a lot of people in cybersecurity would love <laughs> to give you uh, a big hug or a high five or something to say thank you for the work you're doing there. Thinking about those startups now, and somebody getting ready to, you know, kind of in those very, very, very early stages of startup world, right? And I know we ask them to do a lot of things that, you know, I mean, they're trying to get a product out to market, right? <laughs> like cybersecurity, other things are not the first thing on their mind. But if they're, they had it in their mind that like they've heard this and they, 
they, they saw this podcast and they're totally bought in to how important your lessons about empathy and understanding the customer and whatnot. What is one, what's the one piece of advice you'd want to leave them with coming out of this, this chat that we've had for how they can start to build that culture early in their startup? Mm. One thing that I believe in and that I, I, I saw work was to actually make a list of the principles that guide you. And again, this is not about corporate values. This is about those very personal things that you stand for. I think that many of us kind of have an idea about them. We do have them somewhere in the back of our mind. But unless you sit down and write, uh, like just put pen to paper physically uh, and start writing them, that's when you have like very interesting questions going on like yeah but is this more important than that and what does this principle look like in real life am i really practicing it what do my actual facts say about me so that's kind of a let's say a magna carta that you set for yourself a declaration of uh you know <laughs> um I guess, moral independence that you can draw from in the future, even if it's like three things or 10 things or whatever it is, it defines the way we do things around here. And that's a very powerful thing. It defines, you know, who you want to do it for, why you're doing this. It You get to, you know, talk about your why a lot. Um, and it, it helps you also kind of figure out like who are the people who resonate with this? Because that's going to become instantly a filter. You can publish that. Publishing that is actually a very powerful connection that you can make with other people. Um, and you can actually, you know, it, it shows them what you're about. It shows them what you mean, and it gives them a reference point to judge and evaluate all your other actions in the future. And if you manage to stick to those principles that you outline for yourself because you deeply believe in them, that's going to be a powerful driver for the decisions that you make around building your business, hiring people, uh, developing your product, getting involved in the community. And you can turn that one kind of, let's say, piece of content, an initial piece of content, into something that grows with you, into something that drives you, and into something that gives you a lot of energy. And um, this is something that I really believe in. There's, there's this one-liner that stuck with me from a program that I did that's called the Alternative LP MBA, the Alt MBA that Seth Godin makes, uh, which is an incredible program that is completely different from any other educational experience that I've had. And it goes like, people like us do things like this. And to me, that is so powerful. I always, like, my goosebumps every time that I think about it, because I know who the people are, and I know the things that we do, and why we do them, and why we believe in the same things. Um, and that's honestly a huge driver in my life, um, a huge source of connection and gratitude. And I hope that everyone gets to experience that. <laughs> That is awesome. Thank you. There was so much wrapped up in that answer. I love it. The moral independent or declaration of moral independence. I'm using that like everywhere from now on. I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm stealing that phrase. That, is, I, that applies to way more than even just what we were just talking about. So I love it. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we're at that time. We got to wrap up. But this has been an absolute pleasure. And I really honestly... I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate you bringing a very different perspective to the show than maybe what we would typically expect. Uh, just because, I mean, the, the types of people that I'm talking to are in very different roles. And I'm trying to, that's what we're all about here, trying to, to attach to and bring in those different perspectives. So it's been great. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for opening doors for so many people. Uh, your impact and your work uh, is more, your your work's impact goes far beyond than you can see. And I, I just wanted you to know that. And I'm sure that so many other people agree with this. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm, I'm, and I'm trying not to blush again. Um, <laughs> but no, seriously, thank you again so much. And to all of you out there uh, listening in today or watching the recording or listening on the podcast. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Remember, like, subscribe, all that stuff. It's, it is important. It helps us get the message out broader to everyone. And it, it, these are important messages we're talking about here. And so, and next week is going to be no different. We've got another great guest. I'm not going to spoil it just yet. 
but I can tell you right now it's going to be a very, very, very different perspective that you might not have considered before that we're talking about next week. So be sure to come back. I will be here. We will have another amazing guest. But for now, that's all we got today for Screen Bridges. Take care, and we'll see you all again real soon. Bye-bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Securing Bridges Podcast with Alyssa Miller. If you learned something new and this podcast made you think, then share ITSPMagazine.com with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our podcast channels. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.